I once read that to be extraordinary, you have to be authentic. Well, I want to be extraordinary in life, and I want to be authentic in this video and helping you understand federal prison. And if you have this secret fear of going to federal prison, and to help, I'm bringing in props for the first time ever in a YouTube video. I have not one, but two double doubles from In N Out Burger, and these things are heavy. I have not one, but two packages of red man chewing tobacco and to round out the props for the first time ever in a youtube video i have a very nice bottle of the prisoner wine napa valley 2018 so let's jump into this video do you have a secret fear of going to federal prison i know i did welcome everyone i'm justin Paverni. thanks so much for watching this video this is going to be a longer video an important video and to the extent that i can cover the process from indictment to pleading guilty to surrendering to prison. I'm going to do that in this video. I'm also going to cover a number of subjects that I've covered in depth in other videos, like hiring a lawyer, accepting responsibility, going to prison. I will put up the links to those videos in this YouTube description. Part of the reason I'm filming this video, well, there's two reasons. One, a student at BYU reached out who's reading Ethics in Motion, which is required reading there in the business school. And he essentially said, like, dude, I'm so scared to go to prison. I'm like, what have you been doing? Are you making bad decisions? He's like, no, I haven't graduated yet. I just have this secret crazy fear of going to prison. Additionally, I spent some time with Paul on the phone with Paul Bertrand. Paul was the FBI agent that arrested me, who later invited me to speak at the FBI Academy upon my release from prison. And when Paul introduced me on stage at the Academy, he essentially said, had Justin told us the truth when we interviewed him, probably wouldn't have referred him for prosecution. So think about that for a moment. I was so afraid and so fearful of going to prison to the point of literally gorging myself. I want to speak authentically like five nights a week, man, at 11 p.m. with my dog Honey in my lap, pounding through two double-doubles. This weighs like nine pounds, okay? And not only was it the double-doubles, it's the next day playing golf and powering through Red Man Chewing Tobacco, which is quadrupled in price here in California since I was in high school. Terrible decisions, continuing to make bad decisions. And then in the evening, because I was so disgusted and ashamed at my conduct, I'd power through the night, have a little bit of wine, play some online chess, and do it again the next day. I want all of you to be better. And to be better, you've got to be authentic and you've got to own it. So let's talk about my story and how I got here. When I graduated USC, I was a stockbroker. I turned the other way eventually for money while executing trades for hedge fund managers. I also managed money for professional athletes. In time, I learned that one hedge fund client was lying to his investors. And rather than address the lies, I turned the other way for approximately $100,000 a month in commissions. I schemed with my colleagues at UBS to turn the other way for the commissions, uh, turn the other way from his conduct. We tried to protect ourselves so the money would continue to roll in. In January 2005, it all came undone. And I was fired from my job in 2005 at UBS, essentially for my role in what turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. And over the next three years, I made terrible, terrible decisions because like many of you, I was fearful to go to federal prison. So the first thing that I did wrong after I was fired, I began to lie to people, lied to my parents, lied to my friends, told them that I chose to resign from UBS to go manage money and raise money for, for hedge funds, go into real estate. So I began to immediately make bad decisions. So for all defendants, who, for everyone that doesn't want to go to prison, never forget the importance of post-defense conduct. Once you do, once you're in trouble. Once you, what you do when they begin watching you because they're assessing your conduct. Well, after I was fired and I began lying to people, I regrettably had to hire a lawyer. And I had no idea how to hire a lawyer. Do you? If you're in trouble, do you have any idea how to hire a lawyer, the appropriate questions to ask, to review their writing, to find out how they, how they charge, inclusive, hourly, background, referrals? You have no idea. I didn't. I hired someone that someone suggested I hire without any process. And I didn't like the lawyer, in part because I don't think he really cared. He saw me as a checkbook, kind of told me what he wanted to, to tell me, I think, to make me feel better at the moment. But it wasn't real guidance. My fault was never telling him the truth. My fault was wanting him and others to see me as a USC athlete, as a successful stockbroker who was at Bear Stearns and then UBS. So immediately I began to make bad choices because I wanted to be perceived differently. And I also figured I could cover it up because I was so afraid to go to federal prison. I was raised privileged in the hills of Encino. I didn't know anyone that had gone to prison. So when I thought of prison, 
you think of, you know, Shawshank Redemption, Cool Hand Luke. Uh, I didn't know anyone other than, you know, hear of Michael Milken, but I didn't know Michael Milken, even though I grew up not far from his family. So I was so scared about what was in front of me. I was willing to put my body through so much pain and suffering and lie to people. But of course, in the end, the lying and the cover up and all of that has grave, grave consequences, not just, well, not just for me, but for those that loved and supported me. So the first step, if you are traversing the system, if you are scared that you may go to prison, or if you are actually in the, the, the system, you've got to work openly and honestly with your lawyer, and you've got to vet them properly. Now, in my case, I can't tell you that I suffered from a great deal of de depression, though I did suffer from denial. And I had a, a great ability to convince myself that nothing would come from it. And I would convince myself that nothing would come from it by frankly hanging around with people that told me what I wanted to hear, in part because I never told any of them the, the truth. I never told them what I had really done. So of course the response is gonna be, dude, you're great, you're fine, you're not in trouble. You got fired from UBS. A lot of people get fired, go do something else. It's great, it's fine, you're Justin, you're JP. Nothing's gonna come from it. So in order for you to be successful through this experience, you've got to speak openly but you also can't be around P yes people that are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear that's going to make you feel a little bit better and sleep a little bit better. Though in the end, uh, I knew that I wasn't telling them the truth and I was going to go down this path of continuing to make bad choices, continuing to lie to people like my lawyer that, that I had hired. Now, one thing that's interesting, uh, being a white collar defendant, is how long these cases can take to play out. For example, I interviewed with the FBI April 28, 2005. After that interview that I lied in, nothing happened for a year. Zilch. Zero. Nothing. Actually, I thought I got away with it. I thought I was in the clear. I didn't think there would be any repercussions other than some civil suits that came. So over that next year, I was actually in pretty good spirits. I got a real estate license. I was thriving, doing well and didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that meeting with the, the federal government. Well, white collar crime cases can take a long time to, to play out. And rather than accept responsibility and make better decisions during that period, I ate poorly, chewed a lot of tobacco, sold real estate, and got into this pattern of convincing myself that nothing would come. And a year later, April 28th, 2006, I read a very lengthy press release stating that my co-defendant who himself was scared to go to federal prison, was making better choices than me, namely cooperating with the U.S. government. To his credit, I don't begrudge him, good for him. He had a wife and four children, married with four kids, wanted to stay out of jail, afraid to go to federal prison. Okay. I read a year later that he had been cooperating with the government. I learned that when he called me, phone calls were recorded, or when we met, he was wearing a wire. And here's the twisted part of the criminal justice system. Even though he was the originator of the fraud, and I was involved tangentially. The government would even acknowledge I was involved on the periphery because he cooperated and he was more accepting of responsibility. He was the one looking at two years in prison and I was the one looking at five years in prison. So that's a great lesson to all of you who are traversed in the system. It doesn't matter who started it. It doesn't matter if you were swept in. I know if you're involved in the criminal justice system, you didn't have bad intentions. I mean, who the hell you know, graduates college or goes into business and says, yeah, you know, today's today's the day. I, I feel like flushing my life down the toilet and creating victims and embarrassing my family and, you know, going to prison. Prison sounds great. You know, I'm pretty pumped up about going here. It's kind of like a fat farm, big boy time out, go get in some shape. People don't do that. Some, very few actually do it, I should say. But because I was so afraid of what was coming, so afraid of the future, so afraid of owning my consequences and eating food and, you know, drinking good wines to get through the days. I continue to make decisions worse. So the irony is because I was so afraid to go to prison I ended up making bad decisions, I ended up getting a longer prison term because I never should have gone at all had I made better choices. So after that press release comes out in April 2006, I then had to hire a new law firm because the other law firm that I had hired was conflicted. They told me it took years to get some money back from the lawyers. Probably have a better chance of getting a pardon than you do money back from a law firm. So I then had to go out and give a big retainer to a new law firm who then told me, Justin, because you lied to the FBI, because of your bad decisions, and because you have a defendant cooperating against you, you're looking at five years in prison. And even when I heard that, I was in, I couldn't accept it, couldn't acknowledge it. I was willing to flush more money down the toilet, my lawyers let me, by convincing them to let me take a lie detector test. 
And of course they said, you can line up the test. It's going to be expensive. You're probably not going to pass. And I'm like, pass, I haven't done anything wrong. I'm totally insulted that as my lawyers, you don't believe me. So I took the test. Of course, I tried to cheat the exam. I failed miserably. And after I failed that exam that I spent hours trying to prepare for by taking you know, techniques to try to cheat this exam, after I failed that exam, I knew that federal prison was going to be a reality for me. I knew, it was, uh, I, knew I was going. The question was how long. So after I failed that lie detector test in what would have been May 2006, I agreed to plead guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud. And that's when things really began to spiral out of control for me. And never been a drinker. Yeah, I mentioned I had some wine. For me, it was self-loathing and punishing my, my mind and body. So, you know, we joke about this in and out. I actually won't eat this. I haven't had one since I've been home in 12 years because I associate my prior prison life with in and out I, even now I can think of driving through that, that drive through at 1130 and midnight and just gorging myself on this food. And I look at it and it looks delicious and great. I can't eat it because I attribute it to, to, to my former life. You know, every now and again, I'll throw in a little chewing tobacco when I play, but essentially I feel the same way about this. So success that I've had after prison is I've kind of had to purge myself from any vices, anything that brings me back to the life I led before prison. I don't know how you'll respond to it. I don't know what your strategy will be. But when I think of things before prison, I want to extricate them from my life, including these double doubles that are going to, I guess I'll give them to my kids <laughs> when I'm done here. But I won't be eating them as delicious as they, as they are because it takes me back to that self-loathing, pathetic person that I was who could not overcome any adversity, who could not deal with any setback, and who found excuses and going through it, I want you to be better. I want you to know that as human beings, we make bad choices. We can overcome them, but only with a plan and with purpose and with the recognition that as humans, we make bad choices. I wish someone had said that to me. I wish someone had said, hey, you can become better, but it only starts with accepting responsibility and owning what you did. Instead, I focused on Justin first, Justin first. To that end, after I knew that I was gonna to have to plead guilty, I was told that I needed to manage and grow my network. and. I was very opportunistic. I didn't reach out to people to nurture relationships. I'll put up a link to a free character reference course that we have. And in that course, I talk about nurturing relationships with people, expressing gratitude for the love and support that you may have. I didn't do that. I didn't want to call people. I didn't want to meet with people. I didn't want to tell them what I was doing. I finally reluctantly did it when I needed their help, when I told them that I needed a letter. And sure, I got them and I appreciated people for doing it but it wasn't right, it wasn't appropriate the way that I did it. I didn't keep people in the loop. I called them when I needed something. And after I got those letters, the next step was pleading guilty. And of course, the horrific, horrific Department of Justice press release. And let me be clear, I'm not complaining now, I deserved it. The DOJ published these, these releases to deter people, to let people know the consequences of cheating and breaking the law. But of course, those releases are you know, devastating to your family and you, of course. And despite asking the government not to issue this release, they did. And in that release, it said that I could be sentenced to up to five years in federal prison. That came in February 2007. And between February 7 and when I was sentenced in February 2008, I did very little to, to prepare other than work and sell real estate at Sotheby's. But I continued the eating and the chewing tobacco and the playing online chess all night. Uh, There's actually a time when I was playing chess, it was like three o'clock in the morning and I saw like four moves ahead and I bought this, I beat this like mini grandmaster out of like Serbia or something. And I said, that's it. My goal, my chess career is over. I will never play again. I've played too much. I'm seeing four and five moves ahead. It's 3 a.m. I'm fat, bloated and miserable because I'm so afraid to go to prison and I'm so scared of what the rest of my life is going to look like. I'll never play again. And I haven't. Just like I associate you know, in and out burgers with my prior life. That's how I feel about chess. I should say I played a couple of games of chess in prison with Michael Santos, but no more than like two games. I loathe it when I look at it and I'll never play with my children. I'll never play again. Just like I'll never eat another in and out burger again. I just, I'm not going to do it. So the online chess, the loathing, the eating eventually leads to a sentencing hearing of which I did very little to prepare. And somehow, some way the judge sentences me to 18 months, primarily because UBS paid back all of the money I contributed to that so all the victims were paid in full I did work for three years so I'll put up a link to a video I filmed um, just 
uh, having a job lead to a shorter federal prison sentence. It did in my case because selling real estate successfully for more than three years showed the judge that I could live a, a law-abiding life. So things that I had to do because I had to make money to live and pay to lawyers, uh, things time was on my side because it took three years. So I did a few things without even really knowing that they would help me. I did not have a compelling first-person narrative that our team speaks at, at length about. I never worked openly with with my lawyers. I didn't have a chance to cooperate. My co-defendant had seized that opportunity. So I just sort of got lucky in getting a shorter sentence because all the money was paid back. And, and that was a huge deal for me. So of course, after I was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison, that's really the, that's probably the hardest part, believe it or not. I packed up my home, I rented it out. I had to quit my job, of course, because I'm going to prison. All of the press fallout that accompanies I had like four or five Department of Justice releases. And frankly, I was like super excited to get to prison, like pumped up to go to prison. So I'll put up a link to our timeline at White Collar Advice. And I have a photo on that timeline where I was 30 or 40 pounds heavier than, than I was now. And I put that photo up to be authentic, to prove to you that if you're going through the system, I understand it. I'm aware of it. I know the pain. I know the suffering. And I pray that you get through it better than I did. I pray that you get through that time you know, with dignity, knowing that this is harder on, on your family. Uh, I had never had any adversity or setback in my life, so I didn't know how to respond. Many of you watching this have probably overcome so much more than I ever have or may ever endure. And, and I applaud and I admire you for that. My experience with the criminal justice system was my first experience with real struggle and trouble. And I didn't know how to manage it. And that's part of the reason I think I made bad decisions. I just didn't know what the hell to do. So with all of that, I was super pumped up to get to prison. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about prison life in a few minutes. I was super pumped up to go to prison. I felt like I'd been in prison for three and a half years fighting my case. You know, every email or text that would come in, oh, it's my lawyer, they want more money and I gotta go talk to somebody about this or that's the press and a friend reached out to me and. I was just super pumped up to finally get to prison. This weight had been bogging me down for so long. The anxiety of what the experience would, would be like was just, just absolutely devastating to me. So in my case, my co-defendant at sentencing asked for Lompoc. And because he cooperated against me, my lawyers then asked for Taft Federal Prison Camp, which is now closed. I was given 60 days to self-surrender, rented out my home, lived with my very close friend, Sam Pompeo, with whom I sold real estate for more than three years. Sam's the, the best friend you could ever have. You, you, if you have a few Sams in your life, you're gonna be okay. So I lived with Sam, because uh, I had immediately rented out my home. On the morning of my self-surrender to prison, I drove through from Los Angeles through I-5 into Bakersfield with my mom and brother, totally unprepared for my surrender to prison. Like zero planning, zilch, zero, nada. Uh, my business partner, Michael, now business partner, Michael Santos, who wrote so prolifically on the internet about prison. And my mom sent me a bunch of his blogs before I surrendered. I deleted them all. I essentially told her, I don't need to read blogs from a drug dealer who's been in prison for more than 20 years. I ain't interested, don't send them. I'm not gonna read them, goodbye. And I paid the price for it because when I surrendered to prison, I had no idea what to expect because I didn't prepare. I'm stupid. It's foolish. It's my own fault. I continue to live with, you know, my head in the sand like an ostrich. No one to blame but me. So after I surrendered to, to prison, you surrender at the low security prison. And I walked in and said, hello, I'm Justin Paperni. I'm here to self-surrender. And the guard looked at me and said, what's your registration number? And I said, 4449912. And I reached out to shake his hand. And uh, he didn't respond. <laughs> he said, oh, we don't shake hands with inmates. And that's when I knew that oh, like, I'm, in, I'm in prison. It's a different world. And I better learn to adjust. And I regretted that I hadn't invested more time to prepare. From there, I spent about three hours in a holding cell. It was actually in handcuffs for the first time, only for about 30 seconds, while they walked me across uh, the yard uh, in, in the low security prison. And within four hours or so, I was over at the minimum security camp. And in Lessons from Prison, uh, which of course you should read, I go, I write a, two full chapters of the description of the minimum security camp. And they're kind of the same all across the country. They look kind of like corporate, corporate office parks or, or a junior college. But when I made my way over to the camp, I was dropped off at, at camp control. They drive you over from the low to the camp. I had a khakis on, I had yellow. I think of Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, like the yellow slip-on uh, vans. 
and uh, they gave me clothes over at the, the low. I couldn't surrender with with anything. I tried to get in a watch, shoes, nothing. Couldn't get in with any of it. Uh, so I'm sure they gave it away or they gave it to the guards trust fund or something like that, but I didn't have it. So when you surrender, everybody knows that you're the new prisoner. Every, you're dressed differently. The first thing I noticed when I got over to the camp and I found it so, so incredibly odd was, I was like, why are these people smiling? I saw guys running and walking and um, gardening and leaving what I later learned was called the commissary or the chow hall. And I'm like, what are these people smiling at? They're like in prison. What are they laughing about? This is, this is odd. I ventured over to the library and I saw some guys talking and laughing. And I'm like, are these people insane? They're in federal prison. What are they laughing about? I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, of course, it was my first day. I'd been there about four hours. So I'm then led up to D dorm at Taft Camp, or B and D dorm were, were upstairs. I'm led up to the dorm, and the first thing I do, because of, there were so many things I was scared about, about going to federal prison. I was scared about you know violence. I was scared about people with whom I would associate. I was also scared, fearful of what like the bathrooms would look like. Okay, like I think my friends joke like you know Justin's precious tush. You know you can't use the prison bathroom. I'm like that's correct. I was scared to death of what these bathrooms would look like because you think of county jails and the spigot with 20 dudes around there and the open showers. So like the first thing I did when I walked into the dorm wasn't be concerned with what my living situation would be like. I went straight to the bathroom and I will tell you, whew, I exhaled. <laughs> okay, I was pleasantly surprised uh, of the, the the urinals were private and the shower door there were shower doors on there and there was a, a, a much more privacy than I had envisioned. And from there I was led over to my cubicle 32U and my bunkie had been in prison for about six years for a very long white collar crime. And at the time there were three people in the cubicle and the goal in time of course is if you adjust well and you do your job and you're clean and you're hygienic and you avoid problems, you don't speak with staff, things we talk about in our videos and coach our clients, you can move to a, a better bunk all the way in the back of the dorm, which is kind of a game changer if you could have the best possible living situation on the inside because you're going to sleep better. So that first day, of course, was fearful because suddenly I'm in prison, though I realized that it was nothing like I had seen sensationalized on television. I was so grateful for that. The biggest fear then comes, how do you get through the days? How do you actually spend your time? And I knew pretty quickly that there wouldn't be violence on the inside. Like I've said, if you act like a fool in a donut shop, you might get beat up. If you act like a fool in prison, you may get beat up. So I knew if I adjusted well and laid low, things we talk about in our Peace of Mind prison preparation course, it's a free five-day course, I'll put up a link to it. I knew that if I adjusted well, there wouldn't be any violence. But the, the biggest fear suddenly became boredom. How would I spend my days on the inside? What would I do? To, I didn't want to be like some prisoners who were very nice, but they literally spent all day sleeping or watching TV or exercising, complaining. Uh, and I said, my goodness, if I don't create a plan or routine, my time, my 18 months is going to feel like 18 years, no doubt. So I immersed myself with exercise. And because as I mentioned through the, you know, through the double doubles and the eating and the gorging myself, and I was a college athlete, but I didn't exercise at all in my 20s. I associated my my expanding waistline with the inevitable just with working right pudginess comes with working 70 hours a week and i knew it was time to get into shape so i used my initial days weeks and months in prison to exercise aggressively six seven hours a day and for me i became a long distance runner on the inside so here was my routine after about a week or two of getting adjusted i'd get up at about 4 a.m every single morning and at 4 a.m., I liked waking early while the dorm was sleeping. I liked that privacy, some time alone, while the majority of the dorm was sleeping. I was also eating much healthier, so no more double-doubles and garbage, no sugars, no cookies, no ice cream. You can have ice cream for breakfast in prison because when you shop in the commissary, you have to eat it because there's no fridge to go put it in the dorm. I didn't want to do that anymore. I loathed that prior life. I was disgusted and sickened. And how I lived, I used to lay in my rack all night in prison until I'd fall asleep thinking about the decisions that I had made and how hard it must have been for those that loved me. I would have done anything to do it all differently because I was so afraid to go to, to federal prison. So if you're going through this, learn from me and make better choices and recognize steps that you can put in place today and tomorrow. Just break it down by one day. If one day is too overwhelming, half a day. 
an hour, 30 minutes. What can you do in the next 10 minutes to feel more productive and better? I didn't do that as a defendant. I paid the price for it in prison because I was heavier and I was lethargic and tired. And my diet had been so poor for so long, I went through massive withdrawals in getting the sugar out of my system. Much like I have clients that surrender to prison, the biggest withdrawal is their iPhone. The right? I had a client that kind of jokingly said, I miss my iPhone more than I miss having sex. It's the truth. I'm glued to it from the moment I wake to the minute I go to bed. So you've got to adjust some. There are going to be aspects of confinement that are uncomfortable. And that includes going without things that might have been toxic or poisonous to you for so long, as was the case with wine, chewing tobacco, and these damn double-doubles that I consumed eight a week. My goodness. So it was a chance for me on the inside to begin to feel authentic because I told people when I went to prison what I was going to do. And they were probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said that before. You said it again. Sure, Justin. Sounds good. Keep us posted. We believe you. It'll work out great. No big deal. I was tired of feeling like an inauthentic fraud. And I knew prison was a big boy timeout, a fat farm in many ways, an opportunity to recalibrate to prepare for a better life upon my release. And it all started from what I did every day when I got up at four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock, couple of hours alone, because I was eating healthier, I like to use the restroom in privacy rather than waiting till 7.30 when there's gonna be 20 dudes in line with a roll of toilet paper. From there, I'd go to the chow hall every day at 6.30 in the morning. At the time, there was only $290 in the commissary spending limit. And because I was running, within a month, I was doing 10 miles a day. I I ran out of spending limits so quickly. It's why I engage in the prison hustle so extensively because I had to grow my prison budget from like $290. I probably spent seven or 800 bucks a month. I needed to use other guys' books to shop because I was running so much I had to eat. So I had to rely on the commissary. So I went every morning for the milk and um, you know, food, whatever, whatever the hell they serve. So now I'm back up at 7.30 and I would go to the track every morning, run my 10 miles, then my prison job was at 12 o'clock for the first five months. And I would um, do pots and pans in the dish room. So as I talk about in other videos, I'll put up a link. I kind of strategically got myself into the best of the worst jobs in the kitchen. And that was pots and pans five days a week, cleaning pots and pans for lunch and at dinner. So my lunch shift was like 12 to 1. From there, I would have the rest of the afternoon until I had to go back to the kitchen at 5 o'clock. The first four months of my federal prison term, I would use the afternoon to go back out and exercise with my good friend, Andrew Alchek, who unfortunately had an aneurysm and died in federal prison March 21st, 2010. Andrew really, we had the same sentencing judge, Judge Wilson. Uh, Andrew really got me into fitness and understanding how this could be a phenomenal experience in my life, much like Michael Santos did. Leading to Michael Santos, we formed a very close friendship. And it was after about four months in prison where I realized I wasn't afraid of prison any longer. I was afraid of what the rest of my life would look like because I had a felony record. I had created a routine where I wasn't bored primarily because I was so, I was kind of narcissistic for a while. I have to acknowledge of just looking at my physique and watching it like transform. And I can't believe I talked about getting in shape for so many years and now I actually am getting fitter and stronger and better. This is incredible. So I was pursuing that goal, but to the detriment of other things that were as equally important, like how are you gonna sustain a family if you ever have a family? How are you gonna pay back your half a million dollars in restitution, which I've now paid in full. It took me till March of 2019, the half a million bucks. How are you going to do that, Michael would ask me. I'm asking all of you, how will you do it? How will you spend your time in prison? How will you get through your days? Knowing that you shouldn't be afraid now of life on the inside, but rather what life will look like when this experience is behind you. So after about four months in prison, Michael said, what do you do when you go home? And I said, I don't know, man, I'll probably just continue to sell real estate, living in denial, not knowing that my real estate license would probably be imperiled because I have a felony record, even though my conviction was in the securities business. True to form, when I came home, I lost my license, as Michael predicted I would. So based on that conversation about four hours in, four months in, I began to repurpose my time on the inside. I began to continue to wake at 4 a.m. every day, but rather than exercise for six or seven hours a day, I got my exercise in in the morning. I did my prison job. Always do your prison job. Always. You want more halfway house time? You want to be respected by other prisoners? You want to avoid drama? Do your job. You are going to surrender and there will be people that will say, I will do your job for a book of stamps, 20 bucks a month. Do your job. I'm begging you. Do your job. I always did my job. Work out in the morning, do my job in the chow hall. Then in the afternoon, I, I all I did was work with Michael. 
that's all I did. And I used the time in the afternoon. We began working on our blog and our book, Lessons from Prison. I began documenting this experience of life in federal prison, articulating the message that the hardest part of this experience for all of you will not be federal prison. The thing that you should fear is not federal prison. That's kind of the point of this message. You know, Seneca said, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. And I was so convinced that I couldn't handle prison, that I wasn't made for prison, that I made such terrible decisions along the way, destroying my network and my health and my body and mind. The thing that I should have been fearful about wasn't prison, but rather what does the rest of my life look like? Because I have a felony conviction. And even when people say a minimum security camp is a country club, it doesn't bother me. And people see a tennis court or you know, they presume it's, it's a federal prison. That, that's fine. Of course, I would remind all of you that when I was a member of a country club, that the people in the country club didn't defecate in the showers and have Hitler and swastika you know, tattoos. And if you took an apple out of the, the dining room and the, the the country club, you didn't get sent to the hole like you do in, in prison if you leave the chow all with, a, with an apple or, you know, something that you shouldn't have. So I'm always intrigued when people say that life in a minimum security camp is like a country club. I get it, but it doesn't change whether you think it's like a country club or not, that the hardest part can be life before prison. And then for many, it's coming home. And that's how I'm going to kind of wrap up this video for all of you who are traversing the system, I beg you not to be scared about federal prison. It's pretty easy, actually. It can be boring, it can be fun, it can be enlightening. It sounds insane, right? But it's true. At least in prison, you get credit for every time, every day served. You have a clearly defined release date. What happens for most prisoners, and what really compelled me to begin working alongside Michael, was that it was amounting to a life sentence for most of them or for many of them. Imagine serving three, four, or five years and being scared to go home. Because if you've been a physician or a lawyer or a businessman, or you, you've lost your licenses, what are you going to do to sustain your family? And in some cases, if you've made really big money, you've been very successful, it is so humbling and so hard to even, to even begin and start over. So some prisoners won't even try. Some prisoners just reason, I'm a convicted felon, ain't nothing coming my way. Why even begin and start? So if you're gonna be in prison, the experience is eventually going to end. You might as well make the most of the experience. You might as well wake early and create a, record, create a new record, create assets that you can use to influence people who you need to bring into your network. So a successful prison term requires pivoting, associating with the right people, assessing whether your plans make sense. But sometimes you do have, you do, have to do your own thing. Share the story of Frank Abagnale. Of course, he was in the movie Catch Me If You Can. He spoke at the FBI Academy many years before I did. And we had a conversation one time and he sort of said, what matters most is your family and that you're making decisions that, that you believe in and that feel right and you're a good person. I share that with you because you may embark on a mission that people say is crazy, insane. And that's what my family said to me when I was in prison. I began kind of pioneering this prison consulting industry uh, and documenting it and sharing lessons by way of my blog. They all called me crazy. They all called me nuts. They begged me not to do it. And I said, I have to think differently. I'm a convicted felon. I'm an underdog now. I've got to own and be authentic about what I did, what I learned, how I can help people. So fewer families have to endure this wretched criminal justice system. And while everyone said it was a terrible idea, now that it's worked out and it's grown, and our team has helped more than a thousand people over 12 years, though some people say, those same people now say, it's a wonderful idea. It was great. I'm proud of you. Their intentions were good now. Their intentions were good then. I'm just conveying to you while you're in federal prison, rather than running the track all day and watching TV, Kardashians or Sons of Anarchy and other popular prison shows, think about what you want the rest of your life to look like. Because if you don't, well, just look at some of the comments, unfortunately, on my YouTube videos over the years. I've been home for 12 years, 15 years. I can't find a job. I, uh, my network is, is destroyed. Nobody will hire me. I don't want to talk about it. I'm still apologizing for it. I empathize with those comments because I know how difficult it is and you need to learn from them. You need to profit from those comments, from the experience of others who have struggled. And the way that you can do that is how I open this video. To be extraordinary, you need to be authentic. You need to own your conduct. If you broke the law, own it. If you're not working well with your lawyer, tell him or her why. Create a plan to improve it. If you're making matters worse for your family, stop it now. Apologize. Tell them that you want to become better. Tell them you want to become stronger, that this is a devastating experience that you've created and you're going to somehow find a path and create a plan to emerge stronger. Because if you don't, life on the other side will be, many guys wish they were back in prison.
people in the halfway house, man, I wish I was back in prison. This is freaking hard. They want me to get a job for 15 bucks. I don't know what to do. This is beneath my skill set. I used to make a half a million bucks a year. What am I going to do? And it's just part of the journey that I would tell them. All work is honorable, whatever it takes. So I close, I close this video about, do you have a secret fear of going to prison? Here's the point. You should not be feared, scared, or fearful about life in a minimum security camp. No, kind of fun actually. Uh, especially for me, I was 33, didn't have children. Many of my clients are married with children. It's devastating to be away from their children. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. But it's a very easy environment and nothing fearful about it. What's fearful is coming home unprepared. So here's my challenge to all of you. If you've taken the time, how long is this video? Wow, 34 minutes. Here's my challenge to all of you if you're still watching this video and you have interest in ensuring the best outcome, you have to do the work. It's that simple. These videos are useless unless you do the work. So I'm gonna put up a bunch of links in the description here. Wanna read Lessons from Prison? Read it. Our book, Prepare, 27 chapters, up on whitecollaradvice.com. Read it. Want to enroll in our free prison preparation course? Do so, it's free. Want to enroll in our free character reference course to learn how to cultivate a network and get phenomenal character reference letters that can shorten your prison term? Do it. Don't just watch the video. This isn't Netflix. This isn't really here to amuse you. It, it's it's not. I'm 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 kind of I'm an introvert. That's not my job. I'm an educator. I want to inspire. I want to teach. And if you're trapped in the system, I want you to get the shortest sentence. And if you go to prison, have a productive experience. But it's not going to happen, like my golf coach tells me, by watching. You've got to do the work. You've got to put in the reps. You've got to be determined to emerge from this experience better and stronger. And that requires being authentic and owning who you are today and who you want to become. So that's how I'll close. I will acknowledge I was a slob eating eight of these a week. Okay, It's a slob going through a package of chewing tobacco a day. A day. I mean, it's terrible. Because I couldn't deal with setbacks and I didn't want to embrace the reality of the situation. Be better than me. Learn from me. If you do, you'll live with dignity. Your prison experience will be more productive and you'll emerge from this experience stronger, frankly, with a sense of well-being. And I hope a lot of lessons learned throughout this experience. In some cases, many of our clients have learned a lot from this, and I don't really regret it as much as I thought I would because I become introspective, and I know that I'm never gonna return. And I think I'm creating a record that's gonna make my family proud and leave a, a lasting legacy that isn't bad but good. Think about that legacy 100 years out, 200 years out after we're dead, gone, and buried. Your kids, 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 kids. What are they going to say when they hear grandpa or dad or so-and-so went to prison? I want them to say that you learned lessons and you shared them and it made the family better and stronger. At least that's what I hope my two children will say when they hear that their father went to prison. Thank you very much for watching this very long video. As you know, my YouTube videos, I do one take. I have no doubt when I edit this, there's probably some things I should have said uh, differently. I did the best I could. I hope you found value in it. And of course, if you find value, if you do find value, please subscribe to this video. Thank you so much for your attention and time. I wish you all well as you go through this very difficult process. Bye-bye.